Good morning. Good morning. Nice job, ladies. Um, you know, we, none of us know when uh, our last day on earth is going to be. Pastor's going down to uh, listen to Dave Kistler and have a memorial for his son, Nathan. You know, a week ago when he was at a restaurant with some friends, he didn't really know at that time he was going to walk out of there and receive a phone call that Nathan, his wife, and some others had perished in a, a airplane accident. And uh, I've listened to some of his podcasts uh, talking about what's going to go on this Saturday, and I just I, I wouldn't even be able to talk about it. And he's just been so strong through it. And I'm sure the Lord's going to lay something on his heart that's going to hopefully speak to somebody's heart and get them saved. But if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, don't walk out of here today without letting the Holy Spirit speak to you and asking him into your heart because you don't know when your last day is. And if you die and you don't have Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're going to spend eternity in hell. For all of us that have lost loved ones that are close to us or friends that knew Jesus Christ as our Savior, and we know that Jesus Christ is our Savior, we know we're going to see them again. So it's just goodbye for a short time. But if you don't know that they knew Jesus Christ as your Savior, it makes it tough. And we've all had people die that we know. We're not sure if they knew Christ as their Savior. So th let this be the day that uh, you ask Christ in your heart if you don't know him so that one day the circle will not be unbroken. I was standing by my window on a cold and cloudy day when I saw that hearse come rolling for to take my mother away. Well, I told the undertaker Undertaker, please drive slow Cause that lady that you're hauling Lord, I hate to see her go Will the circle be unbroken By and by, Lord, by and by there's a better home awaiting in the sky, Lord, in the sky. Well, I follow close behind her, trying to hold up and be brave. But I could not hold my sorrow. When they laid her in the grave Will the circle be unbroken By and by, Lord, by and by There's a better home awaiting In the sky, Lord, in the sky Will the circle be unbroken by and by, Lord, by and by? There's a better home awaiting in the sky, Lord, in the sky. There's a better home awaiting. In the sky, Lord, in the sky. Thank you, Deacon Water. Going to be a reunion when we hear that trump, right? Amen. Mm -mm -mm. I'm going to ask you all to uh, reassure that you have these things turned on silent, if you will, please. Appreciate that very much. Appreciate that very much. 
Well, we're getting part two of part one. Part one was last week, so you might hear just a little bit of a recap here and there. But the nice thing about you all is you don't even remember last week. <laughs> so that's, today, today that'll be an advantage to me. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. Open your Bibles up to Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, chapter number one with me, please. John, I've gone Roman Baptist, and so far, so good. Sounds like the pages have settled. Let us pray. Our precious Heavenly Father, Lord God, we, we know your grace, because it's by grace we are saved. It's your grace that we believe in. It's your grace that as we, born in this world of sin, commit sin time and time and time again. Those that have hardened their hearts against you, those who have turned the light out. But Father God, for those of us who have heeded the call, the knock on the heart's door by your Holy Spirit, your Holy Word that, that, that teaches us and directs us to the one and only Savior of Jesus Christ. We thank you for all of that today. Now, Lord God, those who are void of those things that may be in our midst today, my prayer is for them first and foremost, that as Deacon Woodard stated, that they would come to know you and answer that call, that knock on the door from your Holy Spirit today as you testify of Jesus being, a, being salvation for them if they would only freely believe in their hearts and accept that. Father God, I thank you for this time. Bless this message. Give, give understanding to those with your Holy Spirit. And Lord God, give under, open the eyes of those today who are without. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So we ended last week in this chapter, so I'm just going to reiterate a few verses here. But, but the topic of the message last week was... The, the spiritual sight, the spiritual sight. Uh, we know 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 tells us in whom the God, that's a small g, that's none other than Satan himself, hath blinded the minds of those, right? Who are without what? The glorious light of Jesus Christ, yeah. So, so we have something, uh, we have something that, that is a treasure and it's so common sense to those of us who who are indwelled by the Holy Spirit is so common sense to us that sometimes we can lack understanding. Mm -hmm. Let me explain that. And I've, I've given this illustration before. I got Brother Billy sitting close by, so this is why people don't sit in the front row. <laughs> so, so, you know, if, if Brother Billy was a lost man, void of the Holy Spirit, he's void of, of spiritual vision, and, he, and I see him doing things that go so against my common sense, my spiritual common sense. And I say, Billy, Billy, my friend, why are you doing that? You need your rear end kicked. Why are you yeah. doing that? You know? And it's like we, sometimes we have a lack of understanding as to why somebody could do certain things to themselves or to their families that are just so stupid, right? To put it plainly. But what happens is, is we have a spiritual sight yes. that they don't have. Yes. And we lose, we, it's hard, sometimes that doesn't compute to us. You see, I know what the Word of God says. And I know what the Holy Spirit does with His Word in my heart. I know that. And it's inescapable. I can't escape it, even if I wanted to, which I don't, but if I did, I couldn't escape it. Because he knows my down-sitting, he knows my, yeah, all of those things. I can't hide from him any more than Adam and Eve was able to successfully hide from him, right? So, so this morning, that spiritual vision that we were talking about, and having that spiritual understanding, 
It's a life-changing thing. Man, when you get saved and you get the Holy Spirit and dwelt in you, it is a life changer. Behold all things. Yeah, become new. It's a life changer. You say, well, I've seen a lot of people profess Jesus Christ, but I've never seen that life change. Guess why? Because they professed it with their mouths and didn't have it in their heart. They're, they're, they're still a lost sinner. They may be a religious sinner, but another, nevertheless, they're as lost as lost can be because they're missing something. So we ended this message, but, but just to reiterate a point that I want us to see in chapter number two, before I look at chapter number one, verse number eight, which is a verse that, that all of us uh, blood-washed, born-again believers in Jesus Christ are very familiar with, for by grace are you saved. Through what? Faith. You see, there's, there's an extra element there. It's by grace, okay? Grace isn't one of you ladies that came in here by the first name of grace. Grace isn't what I want it to be or what I define it or make it to be. Grace is for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Let me tell you something. That's grace. That's the definition of grace in a nutshell. Grace, grace is not that, whew, man, I came to church today. I sat for all that time through that message. I'm good till next week. I'm going to go out to church doors. I can't wait because you know what? Tomorrow night I got a ritual. After I get off work, I'm going to stop and pick me up a six-pack. And I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and I'm going to, and I'm going to, and I'm going to, and I'm going, because I got grace. Wrong. That's not what grace means. That is not what grace means. Anybody that thinks that way is a religious sinner, lost as lost can be. That is not what grace means. Grace begins and ends in John 3.16. Yes. End of story. Grace does not mean I have a license to sin against God. If anybody thinks that they have a license to sin against God, they have no Holy Spirit conviction. If they have no Holy Spirit conviction, they have no Holy Spirit. If they had no Holy Spirit, they've never been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen, church? Amen. Okay, good definitions. Good, easy. All, they're all scriptural. They're all out of the Bible. So, for grace are you saved through faith and not that of yourselves. Now, here's, here, here's the grace definition. Well, I know that I, I come to church because I want to be good. But I know that I don't have to go to church to worship the Lord. There's a big satanic lie in grace. A big, big satanistic lie of grace. Okay, because if you are forsaking the assembling of yourselves together in a manner in which some do, you're sinning against God. You are transgressing against the word of God. I don't give you the, I don't give you the verse of Bob, I give you the verse of God. Hebrews 10.25, right? Forsake not thou the assembling of yourselves in the manner of which some do. When we do that, there should be a Holy Spirit conviction within us that goes, ah, you shouldn't be doing this. Silence <laughs> over the house. The truth of God's word is the least popular thing on earth today. You know, did you know that? I'm not real smart. <laughs> it's the gift of God. It's the gift of God. Unless someone believes in their heart, not in their head, Listen, the devil believes who, he believes in Jesus. He knows who Jesus is. <laughs> What's his chances, huh? <laughs> he believes it. The, the scripture said the devils believe. Hmm? The demons believe. And they tremble. But they believe. What's the chances of one of them getting into heaven? And <laughs> so it's the same thing for us. The same thing for us. So, we read this scripture, we see, I want us to understand that it's not of works lest any should boast. There is not a thing I can do, there's not a thing that I can do of my own mind, of my own volition, to get myself to heaven. I can't be good enough. There's nothing, absolutely nothing. You see, there's the grace. 
That's the measure of grace God is giving us. You can't do anything. I did it for you. In as much as I gave you my son. And when I look at you, I don't see your sin. Because I won't look upon sin. That's why, that's why it got so dark and my turn, my, my, I turned my back on my own son. Because I, he took my sin to the cross. He couldn't look upon that sin. I don't see your sin when I look at you. I see the blood of my son, Jesus Christ, when I look at you. You know, if you're not, that's the grace right there. Yeah. That's the grace. The Apostle Paul prayed here. And there's something about this sight. He prayed, uh, if we can look in chapter number 1, and we see in verse number 15, he says, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your what, church? Faith, faith in the Lord. He, he didn't stop after I heard of your faith. He says, faith in the Lord. Let me tell you the difference between that kind of faith and religious faith. So, so if, there's a, if there's a dividing line about midway where this pulpit's at right here, and, 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 re, and I walk, and I'm a religious guy, religion, Okay, I'm a religious guy. I'm going to get to this line. It'll take me to this line where I'll stop. But faith, not in me, not in you, but faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in the Word of God. Faith in the Holy Spirit of God. There's no line. There's no line. I'll keep walking in faith till he says, stop. You see, religion takes you to the part that takes you through the part that's known, and when you get to the unknown, you all of a sudden throw out the anchor. But faith takes you into areas that I have no idea what I'm going to say. I have no idea where I'm going. I have no idea when this is going to be over with, and I have no idea of the outcome. But I've got faith that God is leading me, and I'm in His path. His light, His lights, lights my feet, lights my path, and I'm going. I'm going. You see, that's the saving faith that the Bible talks about. There's a lot of people that will tell me that they're Christians and that they're saved, but they won't walk that kind of walk. So they walk a religious walk. They walk a religious walk. And a religious walk, they're blind in the spirit. And I'm not getting very far here. So let's, let's get, get rolling. Verse number 16, he says, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. The Apostle Paul talks to the church at Ephesus, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding. The what? The eyes, yeah, of your understanding. That's a spiritual vision, spiritual eyes, that, the, that only the saved have being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of the glory of the inheritance in the saints. You and I, amen? In the saints. So much like Paul praying for the, the people at the church at Ephesus, then we go on to see that, that God, when he led the children of Israel, when he led the children of Israel out of Egypt, he too had to give them a spiritual vision. He had to open their eyes. So if you'll turn over to the book of Exodus with me, that's, that's the second book in the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, chapter number uh, 19. Chapter number 19. We're going to see some great, great similarities between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Did you make it there, church? Yeah. All right, Exodus 19. Let's take a look at verse number 14 here. Verse number 14. Moses went down from the mount unto the people. And what did he do to the people? What has God done here today at the New Testament Baptist Church? Did he not sanctify his people? Did you not come apart from the world to come in here today? Is this not holy ground set apart, sanctified, for the worshiping of our Savior, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and for the arming of the saints to go out with the gospel into the world. 
and carry out the Great Commission, this is holy ground. This is sanctified. It is set apart for that purpose and that purpose only. It's not a place that I invite the world into or and I, dis I discourage you to not to ever invite the world in here. It's not a place, I mean, if people want to come and they're coming to hear about Jesus Christ, they're more than welcome. If they're coming for some other reason, this isn't for them. It's not for them. I'm the, I'm the under shepherd. What's a shepherd carry? A staff. One end has a hook, right? You pull your sheep in, you clean them up, you patch them up, you first aid them. What, what's on the other end? It's there for the wolves. Boom! Out! Out! The church isn't a place to bring the world into. It's sanctified and set apart for a purpose. The old devil, he don't teach that lesson today. Everybody's welcome. You'll never see everybody's welcome on my sign. Or I won't be the pastor here. You know who's welcome? People who want to come hear about Jesus Christ. Amen. That's who's welcome. Outside of that, <laughs> The one thing I know for sure, I will never have to stand in shame before my Lord on that question. You brought that, you brought the things of the world. You told everybody they were welcome to come in here. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. I said, you're welcome to come in here if you want to hear about Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah. So we see here in, in Exodus chapter number 19, verse number 14, and Moses went down from the mount to the people. He sanctified the people. What'd they do? When they were sanctified, what'd they do? You getting any New Testament hints here? Huh? They're sanctified and set apart. What's happening to you right now? What are you being washed by? The water of the word. Yeah, you, you're, getting, you're getting a wash job. You're getting a shower job this morning. Coming into the Lord's house on holy ground, you're getting washed by the water of the word. That's what we're supposed to do, amen? Amen. Okay, so we see that. And then we go on, and, and he said to the people, be ready against the, what day? Third day. Well, what do we know about the third day in the New Testament? What's so significant about a third day? Did something, did something pretty neat happen on a third day? Jesus rose. Jesus rose. Well, he rose from the tomb. Everybody got to hear about God that day, didn't they? Amen. Everybody got to hear about God that day. Well, it's no different here. We, we see a foreshadow. We see a foreshadow. And he said, unto the, he, said, he said unto the people, Be ready against the third day. Come not at your wives. Guys, keep your hands off your wives. You're not allowed to have any relationship with your wives during this time period. You've got to remain clean and sanctified and set apart for a purpose. Because you're about to meet God. That's what's going on here with Moses and the people. Verse 17, Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. Amen? Amen? To meet with God. And they stood at another part of the mount, and Mount Sinai was altogether on smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long, and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him with a voice. And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai, in the top of the mount, and the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount, and Moses went up, and the Lord said unto Moses, Go down, charge the people, lest they break through unto the Lord to gaze, and many of them, what? Perish. perish. Yes, and many of them perish. You know, in verse 14, we see that he sanctified the people there, didn't he? He set those people apart, is what he did. We see that this meant getting them physically and spiritually ready to meet God. And that's what, we're, that's what it's all about today. We're here physically and to prepare spiritually to meet God in his house today through the Holy Spirit of God. The people were, were to set themselves apart from sin. They were, they were to get the world off of them, forget all that, leave all that stuff behind. 
And don't worry about what goes on in their ordinary daily routines. That's not important. This Make this the most important moment of your day, of your week, of your life. Amen. Today should be the holiest time you've had all week. Amen. Today. Today, the sanctuary right here at New Testament Baptist Church is a place. It's set apart for us to come together from the world, from our daily routines, from the job place, from the sin, just from all the stuff, and come in here in a safe haven with God's angels encamped round about protecting us. Amen? Thank you. Verse number 16, you know, says that, 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 and it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and thick clouds upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all people that was in the camp, what'd they do? Trembled. They trembled. They trembled. They trembled. And let me tell you something, when you have the presence of God in your life, you will tremble. Saved person, we know this. We know that, uh-oh, I stepped somewhere where I shouldn't be right now. I've said something that I shouldn't have said. I've done something that I should not have done. And what happens to us that, old, that the Holy Spirit does to us? Conviction. Conviction, like a criminal standing before the judge. And so what do we have to do? Well, we don't seek grace. We already got that. We seek mercy. 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 We cry for mercy. Yeah. And John 1.9 tells us, Brother Harold. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Amen. Amen. You see, there's grace. There's grace. There's grace. But you know what? If we're not convicted, that it causes us to go take that, 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 that Holy Spirit bath and get rid of shower to get rid of that sin and give it to God, we don't have the Holy Spirit. Which means we're as lost as lost can be. And you say, oh, I'm in church, I, I'm a good boy, I come to church every Sunday. You're a religious sinner. It ain't gonna work. <coughs> so God showed him his power. He showed him his awesome size. He showed him uh, 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 his holiness. His, he showed him his untouchable holiness. Verse 12. Look at verse number 12. And thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourselves that ye not go up into the mountain or touch the border of it. Whosoever touches the mount shall surely be put to death. You realize... Sin can't reach God. If sin tries to cross a boundary towards God, it gets destroyed. It's already judged. That's why we got to have Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. That's, see, that's why we have to have Jesus Christ. Because we can get to Jesus Christ, can't we? Amen. We sure can. Once we get to Jesus Christ, he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. We've got an intercessor. But you try to get to Jesus Christ, it's going to be like NASA trying to put a brand new rocket up without fuel in it. It's not going anywhere. Not going anywhere. You know, he shows, we see the mercy in verse number four of this chapter. You've seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. That's mercy, right? Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a pe peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, the Lord says. That's mercy that comes with a conditional pro promise of if you will, right? If you will. So we see that. God is a God of holiness, He's a God of perfection. He's a God where sin cannot exist in his presence. It is virtually impossible. And they saw his mercy. And if you don't have this spiritual vision today, keep paying close attention to the scriptures as we look at them. You're gonna, if you don't have that spiritual vision, there's, 
It takes spiritual vision. It takes spiritual confidence in the Holy Spirit to be able to walk in that kind of faith. Without it, you can't do it. Without it, it becomes very trying. It becomes very routine. It becomes very arduous. And after a while, you just give up and you quit doing it. We've all seen that, right? There's not a person here that, that loves the Lord Jesus Christ that hasn't sat in this church and watched people come, come, come. Boy, they just are on fire. They want to do this. They want to do that. And all of a sudden, it's like they, it's like they got raptured. Where'd they go? Where'd they go? That's the religious center. This flesh can't keep that game up. It's impossible. Turn over to 2 Kings chapter number 6 with me. 2 Kings chapter number 6. Thank you, baby. 2 Kings 6. I just love Elijah. I just, it just re, it reminds me a lot of me, which is not always a good thing. Verse number 13 here in chapter number 6. So here's what's going on. The Syrian king, he wants to know where this Elijah's at. He's going to get him. He's going to get him. Okay, there's been a volley between the Israel, Israeli king, now the Syrian king. The Syrian king wants to know where this Elijah, this prophet, this man of God, where are you at? Where is he? I want him. And he's going to be kind of subterfuge about it. So we see in verse number 13, and he said, go and spy where he is. He gives it the kingly edict here that I may send and fetch him. Doesn't that sound so nice? Huh? A king, I'm going to send and fetch him. As it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. Oh, oh. So now we know where he's at, the king says. Therefore sent he hither horses and chariots and a great host. Does this sound like somebody that's going to get a warm reception? <laughs> Not to me. <laughs> and they come by night. Ah, uh, the cover of darkness. <clears throat> and compassed the city about. Surrounded the city of Dothan. Because this prophet, this man of God was there. And he wanted to go fetch him. In verse number 15, and when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, a host compassed the city, both with his horses and chariots. So what do you see? Oh, the man of God has a servant. He's got somebody helping him out. This guy gets up in the morning, rubbing his eyes, walks outside and goes, whoa, <laughs> all around the entire city. Horses, chariots, military men. Quite a sight to see. Verse 6, he, then, he says, then he says in verse number 15, And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? How shall we do? What do you think he meant? Now what are we going to do? How are we going to withstand this? How will we do? Listen, those of us who understand the real, true faith in Christ possess the Holy Spirit of God in this tabernacle, we possess an understanding and a spiritual sight direct from heaven. And when we do that, we know something. It's not how, it's not how 
how shall we do? No, it's how shall the Lord do? Amen? See, he didn't know that. We know that today. It's not how, it's not, if I'm looking at that same thing, it's not going to be, whoa, whoa, how do we do? <laughs> we ain't doing nothing against something like that. But we know how shall God do, right? How shall God do? That's the difference in that spiritual sight of faith versus religious sightlessness. We know that our angels, Matthew chapter 18, we know, I'm not going to turn there, we know that our angels do see our Father's face in heaven. Right this minute, I'm preaching against everything that the prince and the power of the air stands for. I'm preaching against everything that Satan and his emissaries and his demons stand for. He hates the things coming out of my mouth. And I'll tell you right now, there's a battle going on around me right now that God is winning. And I know that. I know that. How do I know that? How do you prove that to me, preacher? By faith. Amen. By faith. And I think, I think you all know my fruits well enough and my testimony well enough that even if some of my old comrades came here and said, if you don't stop that, we're going to have to take you to jail, brother. I say, well, you might as well get them handcuffs out. Yeah. Might as well. Bonds, $10,000. That's okay. I think the family of God could come up with that in about a New York second. Right? Okay, can I have it in five minutes? <laughs> Just, just test. But having the Holy Spirit of God equips us with a vision. And we can act without fear. We can, we, can, we, we can act in God's power. We can act in sound mind. Timothy 1.7 tells us all of those things. It's a gift. And we with spiritual sight know, we know that we are never, ever alone. Amen? Amen. We are never alone, no matter what the situation is. You know, physical sight, wasn't it physical sight that caused Eve to sin? She saw, remember? And Satan said, well, you know, he wrapped, he wrapped, up, he wrapped up one lie in four little truths there. Um, what about, what about, what about, what about, sexual sins. Aren't those brought on by physical sight? Sure they are. Now I always tell you, and get myself in trouble, I know, beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Physical sight causes us to sin. Spiritual sight can stop us from sinning. It can override the physical. It can overcome the physical. It can overcome the flesh. Amen? Amen. If we walk in that spirit. But to have, be able to walk in that spirit, you've got to have it in the first place. And to have the spirit, you've got to have Jesus Christ in your heart. Can't get one without the other. Spiritual sight never causes one to sin, but can stop sin. Can, and it can also keep us from sinning. Amen? We just got to continue to walk in the Spirit. It's when we're not walking in the Spirit when we sin. <clears throat> I think of it like a balloon. If I, if I pulled a balloon out of my pocket, which I don't have one. Anybody got one? <laughs> I pull a balloon out of my pocket. I toss it out to somebody here. What do you got to do to get that balloon inflated? You got to blow it up with your own breath, don't you? Now, here's what I like, and this, this is my five-cent illustration to you. You have to blow it up with your own breath. Now, you want to keep, if we, if you, if we want to keep that balloon afloat in here, what do we have to do? We got to keep smacking it up in the air, don't we? All the time, all the way through here. If I had that, you guys would be having fun with that. You'd be like a bunch of people in the nursing home during... <laughs> See, that's what religious people are like. 
That's what the religious lost religious sinners like. They come into church today, and I got to keep smacking them up in the air to keep them afloat. And as soon as they leave today, guess who's not smacking them up in the air to keep them afloat? So guess what happens? But they've done okay. They've done good. They made it to church today. They're being good. They did that. But what about keeping that balloon afloat? You see, folks that have the Holy Spirit of God in them today in God's house, you're like the helium balloon. Okay? We don't have to keep smacking it to keep it afloat. The Holy Spirit, the helium, keeps it afloat. Amen? Yeah. And, and, and every once in a while, yes, it's going to need to be filled, right? Filled. Filled. What Scripture tell us? Be filled with the Holy Ghost. Yes. You see, after a while... We're going to get tired of smacking that balloon in the air. It's going to become a very arduous routine, and we're just going to quit. That's the religious center. They get tired of smacking the balloon in the air to keep it afloat. Can't do it. Can't take it anymore. Whereas we that have the Holy Spirit of God, our balloon stays aloft. We just have to fill, make sure it's filled every once in a while. Big difference there. Having the Holy Spirit equips us with spiritual vision, which is a wonderful thing. Verse 16 and 17 says down here, And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. That's an answer of pure, unadulterated faith from Elisha. Fear not, those that are with us are more than they that be with them. And, and you know, that servant's like, what you talking about? Are you crazy? Look at this. I don't see anybody with us. Legions of angels, right? Jesus said, I could have called legions of angels. My scripture in Matthew 18 says that as a child of God, my angels, plural, do see my Father's face in heaven. I don't know how many that is, but I know it's more than one. It's probably a million for me. See, physical sight can also, from time to time, keep us from sinning. But only momentarily. Let me explain that. Let me explain what I mean. Only momentarily. That religious physical sight can only keep us sinning only momentarily. I, the Lord blessed my wife and I with two daughters. Unfortunately, from dad's eyes, beautiful daughters. You hear what I said? Unfortunately. Because you know what? As a dad, you don't trust anybody. No offense to anybody that has liked my daughter, but I'm a dad. I have two beautiful daughters. I don't trust anybody. <laughs> That doesn't mean I hate anybody. It doesn't mean I hate them, right? It just means, no, 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 no. Prove yourself to me, <laughs> okay? I don't trust anything by faith there because I'm dad. <laughs> I'm dad. I have two beautiful daughters. Oh, when they were growing up, they got into their teen years. Sorry, Rebecca, to embarrass you. I don't mean to embarrass you. Well, maybe so. <laughs> I've come home from work. For our visitors, I spent 38 years in law enforcement. I'd come home from work. I'd see that boy's car in my, in my driveway. Now my wife's home, and you know, it's not like they're unchaperoned or anything, but I'd come home, I'd see a boy's car in my driveway. No matter how much I was smiling in my car, listening to the radio on the way home, I would wax <laughs> stone face. Boom, stone faced. Where's he at? (laughs) 
Because I know I got two beautiful daughters and neither one of them that's sitting there with a boy anywhere near them because guess what I am? I'm a boy. <laughs> and I know that. I was born like that. I'm still like that. And I know, I know what boyhood teenage libidos are like. Amen? Amen. Not around my daughter. <laughs> So I know, and I know that spiritual sight can stop sin in its tracks for a moment. But you can't, it won't sustain it though, okay? But it's just for the moment that it's within the physical sight. So I know that. So I'm the cop, putting bad guys in prisons, chasing murderers, kicking indoors. And the moment I walk through the door and I look that boy in the eye, guess what leaves him? <laughs> All that excited libido goes <laughs> for that moment. For that moment. So physical sight can not only tempt us to sin, physical sight can stop that sin for a moment. Just for a moment, though. But spiritual sight, friends, that can stop sin forever, forever, when we walk in the sight of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we know that he's walking with us. Here's the problem. To the religious sinner, God's authority, God's authority, must be greater than the temptation that's within us. Amen? And to the religious sinner, they don't have that. They don't practice God's authority because they don't have the compulsion of the Holy Spirit to walk in the Spirit, so they cannot do that. As I close, turn to Romans chapter number 8. Romans chapter number 8. If you fathers of daughters ever want free advice, come see me. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. What a blessing that is, amen? amen? Who walk not after the flesh, but after the what, church? Spirit. Yeah, very important. You see, there's no confusion there. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Yes, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. I'm going to tell you right now, my wife and I were preparing last night because we were walking in the Spirit, we were minding the things of the Spirit. What are we going to wear to church tomorrow morning? What are we going to wear to church tomorrow morning? Who are we going to see in church tomorrow morning? We were, before, when we prayed over our meal, we prayed for this morning. We prayed for everybody that would be here, and we prayed for those who wouldn't be here last night. See, that's walking in the spirit, not the flesh. Verse number five says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. 
For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh, watch this, folks, cannot please God. You've got to be in the spirit to please God. But you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. How? If you call yourself a Christian and you tell yourself, you know, I know I'm saved, I know beyond any doubt whatsoever I'm saved, and next Sunday morning comes to you. No, next Saturday night comes to you. And you begin to formulate a plan or an excuse or a reason not to be in the house of worship, worshiping the Lord, being washed by the water. You begin to plan that. You begin, you begin to contrive that right there. And there's no conviction on you. I'm going to tell you what you're not. You're not in the spirit. You don't even have the spirit. That's all flesh. It's all flesh. So remember that next week when I'm looking out there looking for you. Remember, I'm going to even tell you, I'm going to be looking for you. I see all the faces here today. I'll be seeing which ones are not here next week. Say, preacher, that's meddling. It's my job. It's my job. Where do we leave off? In verse number 10, if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead also shall quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. See, the flesh wants to stay home. The flesh don't want to come to church. The flesh don't want to do those things. We're not to live after the flesh. The flesh don't want to work for God. The flesh wants to quit because these things have become too routine, too arduous for us. For if we live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. My opinion could never do a better job than what the Word of God just Amen. did. We're going to stand together and have a time of invitation. If you have not truly trusted Jesus Christ in your heart and believed in your heart, this invitation is for you to come. We'll take the word of God. We'll pray with you.